your Bibles, if you will, this morning and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5 as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Interestingly enough, we are in a very practical session. We started, this whole thing started with us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 where it says, Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Now the first thing he hit was, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Secondly, husbands, submit yourself to the Lord. Children, submit yourself to parents. Now we're at this section, slaves, submit yourself to your masters. The original language here, slaves, is really slaves. A lot of times in the New Testament, it is called bond servant because our culture has a real aversion to the word slave. We think of uh, the atrocities of slavery in our own country, even though we must admit there were some really good slave owners. There were some bad ones, but there were occasionally good ones. Where do you think the slaves, the black community, got its religion? It got it from slave owners. They taught them faith. They taught them salvation. So slavery is basically a bad word in our society. But here we have, uh, in this particular passage, when Paul wrote this passage, there were about 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. That's almost more than majority of the people in the Roman Empire. And when Paul wrote this, the slaves were acquired by several ways. You could get a slave by buying a slave, exchanging for slaves, satisfaction of a debt. You could get a slave through gifts, inheritance, voluntary surrender, arrest, birth, or a prisoner of war. Now, the only way to get out of slavery in the Roman Empire, freedom for them came by redemption In fact, the Bible word redemption, which we use when we talk about our salvation, is purchasing out of the slave market of sin. You and I were slaves, and Christ's blood and his sacrifice on the cross purchased them out of this slave market for all who would believe in him. You could become a slave through injury, restitution, Uh, You could be freed, rather, by injury, restitution, the master's death, or release by a master. Conditions were not really very good as a slave. In fact, uh, they were harassed. They were traded. On the other hand, slaves were physicians. Slaves were teachers. Slaves were took care of families. Slaves had all kinds of occupations in the Roman Empire. And Paul, when he discusses slavery and slave owners, there is nothing mentioned that affirms slavery. In fact, the Bible neither condemns slavery nor condones it. It just treats it as something that is real. You had it in the Old Testament, and you have it in the New Testament, and uh, you had slavery, and you still have slavery today. In many countries, and in many nations today, the people are slaves. The government tells them what to do, and where to go, and how to do it. So the discourse, however, even though the Bible does not condemn slavery, it was slavery that put an end to slavery. All right, that was wrong. It was the Bible that put slavery to an end, Christianity, even though it didn't condemn it, and even though it didn't condone it, the scriptures, Christianity, put it to death. Look at these two verses. Look at Galatians 3.11. It's on the screen. A renewal, it says, in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. You see right away already, that's not Israel and There was a distinction under Israel. But under the church, there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, 
barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all in all. That was the teaching of Christianity. No difference between slave and the free man. Galatians 3.28, it says this, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Take a look at Philemon. Philemon is a little letter that is tucked away in Scripture between Titus and Hebrews, is a little letter that Paul wrote to a slave owner. He had a slave that actually ran away. He stole some money from the master and fled to Rome. And he meets the Apostle Paul. Probably knew about Paul from Paul's relationship to his master Philemon. And we pick up the story in verse 10 of Philemon. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. In other words, Onesimus, Onesimus was saved, led to the Lord by Paul while he was in prison, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Philemon found Christ and made all the difference in the world. I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. Now, under Roman law, Philemon could have had Onesimus killed. He had that kind of power. Paul is now sending him back to Philemon. In verse 15, for perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Just a reminder, by the way, I'm the one who led you to the Lord, and you're walking with the Lord. But actually, Philemon had that kind of power. Now, here's what he says to slaves. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Now, I'm not, we're not talking about slaves here, but there are principles here that are actually true of an employer-employee relationship as a worker working for someone else. If you're working for someone else, these principles here apply to you and something that we need to carry out as believers. He says, be obedient. This is a continuous present imperative. Do what someone says and carry out the orders that you've been given. Be obedient. Same word he said to children in the previous verse. The master, he said in this passage, that you are the object of this obedience is to be submissive to them. Masters according to the flesh. In other words, your human superiors. Be they the owner, be they the superintendent, be they your boss. We ought to be obedient continuously. In Colossians 3.22, he says, slaves... In all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, in everything. I remember the first time I went out to work for a farmer. I got these instructions from my father, and he said, okay, he may not farm like you farm. And he may not do it just exactly as we do it. And you may think it's kind of funny. You do it the way he says to do it. And if you do a good job and you work hard 
and you're faithful, there may come a time you can even talk to him and say, well, there might be a better way to do this. Or in fact, his way may be better than ours. You don't talk back, you do what you're told to do. And you do it immediately. That sound like a good deal? <clears throat> and you do it with fear and trembling. This is the first of two instructions that was given to the slaves. The word fear is used in 521, where we already submit to the Lord in fear. With respect, not dread, not terror, but respectfully. In fact, it said in Ephesians 5.33, Nevertheless, let each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself, and his wife must see to it that she, here's our word, respects her husband. Same word, fear, phobos. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, we're told, All those who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. How are you to talk about the owner of your company that you're working for or the individual you're working for? How are you to talk about him? How are you, you to deal with him, even if he's harsh or even if he's picky eunish? How are, you to, how are you to talk about it? You talk to him, as it says in the scriptures, to regard their own masters as worthy of what? All? Anybody here listening? Of all what? Honor. So when you talk to somebody else about your boss, what do you, how do you talk about him as a Christian? You're never going to win him to the Lord if he needs to be saved. You're never going to win him to the Lord if we're not respectful, right? We're never going to be, even if he is a Christian, we're never going to be, uh, help him out and encourage him if we don't speak to him as all honor. Even if he treats you sometimes not so good. You got to give him all honor. You got to remember this. We all have to remember this. Who gave us our jobs? God. I went to seminary, I worked for a filling station and we did light mechanical work and we actually filled cars full of gas and washed their windows and if you wanted to, we vacuumed them out all for 29 cents a gallon. Checked their oil, checked the water, checked their tires, whatever they wanted. And then we did light work in the, in the back. We had two bays where we did, worked on cars. And I can remember when I would go to seminary, I'd have grease in there. You just couldn't always get it out. You know how that is? And I'd look at the lily white hands of the rest of the seminary students. I'm sitting there with grubby, calloused hands. And I was working on a heater in a car. My feet were over the back of the front seat and I was underneath, <clears throat> had a trouble light, it dropped, burnt my cheek. And I said, okay, I'm done with this. I had a crabby boss. I said that with honor. <laughs> but he tended to be a little moody. And it fell on me and I said, you know what? I'm going to go to him and I'm going to quit. And while I was stewing this over, I remembered how it was that God got me this job and how important it was when I got it. And that I was here and I was one of the believers and I could witness to several other guys that worked here. That was important. So I worked there all those years. I worked with another guy that told me every Friday, this is my last time here today, I'm quitting. Worked for him for two years. You know, God gives us this job and this word trembling and fear is one of respect. In 1 Corinthians 2, 3, Paul said this of my, his own ministry. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And I can say that's part of the ministry. 
You know, leading a congregation or being a part of the congregation, you do it with fear and trembling because, man, we're dealing with eternal lives. And we're, doing, we're dealing with truth. And I pray before I get up here almost every Sunday and say, God, help me to say the truth. Help me to give this passage in truthfulness. Bear the truth. Fearing that you might lead somebody astray. He said this about Titus in 2 Corinthians 7, 15. His affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 12. So my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not with dread, but making sure that you're living up to the fullness of what God intends us to be, being saved individuals. So this is the way we're to approach our masters, our bosses, our masters, those who are over us. Especially you young people, you teenagers, when you take a job, you're to give it 100%. They tell you to sweep the warehouse. Just look at it this way. You're sweeping the temple of God. And you're sweeping it. And you're sweeping every corner. And you're not sweeping stuff under the rug. You're doing the full job that you can do to the best of your ability with singleness or sincerity of your heart phrase can be singleness of the heart, not double. It's, un it's in contrast to cunningness or craftiness, cutting corners where you can, or lying. The idea of, is the slaves are to obey with wholeheartedness or with their whole heart. There's no duplication in what they're doing. There, it is 100% of their attitude or actions. That's the way we're to approach our job. Be a farmhand, be an accountant, be a nurse, be a doctor, be a housewife. You do the housewife thing every way you can with enthusiasm. Whatever God's given us to do. Look at the example of Joseph. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 39, 5 and 6. Now, Joseph's brothers hated him. And they decided the only way to get rid of this guy is kill him. But being Hebrews and Jews, they decided, why not make some money on him? So they sold him to some Ishmaelites that were traveling for, through. They sold him into slavery. He became a slave. He was bought by Potiphar. In Genesis 39, verse 5, we read, it came about from the time he made him overseer in his house, that's Potiphar, and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owed owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. What's the biggest problem with business owners today? Finding what? Good help. If you're a Christian, you ought to be the best employee that person has. Going over the line in many cases. Going beyond what you're expected to do. Amen? That's, what it, that's our job. Look at Joseph. He was a slave. Probably 17 years old when he was sold. And so as a teenager, he gained that respect. And he worked hard, and he did a, hard, a day's work for it. 
Well, you know the story, he got framed. He got framed in a rape case. That's not a good reputation, is it? And as a result, he went to jail, from a slave to jail. Look at verse th chapter 39, Genesis, verse 22 to 23. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. So whatever was done there, he, that's Joseph, was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. You get a side of the character of Joseph? He was one trustworthy, loyal employee. Why? Because the Lord helped him. He belonged to the Lord. And one day, you know the reward, he went from the jailhouse to the penthouse. He went from jail to being the prime minister of the land of Egypt, the most powerful land, wor world government in that day. I'm not saying that God's going to promote us all that to all that, but I'm just giving the, you the principle we're to do this as to Christ in this verse. Christ is our ultimate master. Whether I'm keeping the house and I'm a housewife, then I do my job as a housewife, the cleaning of the house, the care of the children. I do all of that for the glory of God. And in, in obedience to my own husband, submission to him. And if I'm a husband, then I do the labor that God has given me or the business that God has given me. Whatever I do, I do to the glory of God. You want to know the will of God for your life? The will of God for your life is what you are doing right now. That's the will of God for you. If he wants you in another job, he'll put you in another job. If he wants you to go to school as a teenager, he'll give you direction. Trust him. But right now, as if you're a student in school, you are to do what kind of job? The best job you can do. They say, read the book, read the book. All of it. Right? Don't get the cliff notes, don't cheat. Do the whole thing with a smile. Same way I work. You know, since the curse of the, God made us to work. <clears throat> God took Adam and Eve and put them in a garden and Adam was expected to till it. Some of the stuff didn't even, wasn't even growing when Adam was in the garden. Chapter 2, it was waiting for Adam to till the ground, to farm the ground. And guess what? When he sinned, the ground was cursed. Now the ground fights him. It, it took work to work the ground. The gr ground does not cooperate with us. And you can say that about every job you'll ever have. There's stuff in that job you don't like. I don't care what job you have. There's certain things about preaching, ministry, I don't really, isn't my favorite thing to do. I'm not going to tell you. You probably already guessed it. Just because it's hard to give time to it. And there's everything about your job, whatever you do, certain things you don't like to do. But you do it all, why? You're serving Christ. You're doing it because God wants you to do it. You love him. I don't think it was the easiest thing, and we know it wasn't. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he pray? Not your will. Not my will, but your will be done, as he anticipated bearing our sin on the cross, dying for us, humbling himself, 
to do the job? <clears throat> you know, that makes even a lesser job more exciting. When I was college, I had the glorious job, really a neat job. I was a janitor on a pony farm. That's the lowest job you can get on a pony farm. And uh, we did it to the glory of God. And we, a couple of us were believers who were doing it. We had a great time doing it. And uh, right outside of Omaha, this pony farm, interesting place to work. But I can remember we'd all go to the garage and eat our meal on Saturdays. And all I heard was what? Griping how bad the owners were and how bad and tough it was. And I used to tell people who worked in a corporate in Kansas City when they would get around the water cooler or coffee place or wherever and they'd hear all these complaints. All they had to do was say, you know, I'm just thankful God gave me this job and I just praise his name. That ends that real fast. Not by way, look at verse 6. The attitude of the heart, verses 6 and 7. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves doing the will of God from the heart. Negatively, the slave's work is not to be done when the boss is watching or only when he's around. I am to work as hard in that place when the boss is standing right beside me or when he's out of town. Be careful to work while the master's watching leads him to be a man pleaser, not a God pleaser. See the difference? If I'm only working to please the boss, then I'm a man pleaser. You don't want a man pleaser for your minister and you don't want a man pleaser working for you. You want somebody and you need and I need to work as hard whether they're looking at us or watching for us or not. Look at Galatians chapter 3, 22 to 24. Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, just a previous book. Turn back, or excuse me, turn to Colossians, excuse me. Colossians 3, 22 to 24. Colossians 3, 22 to 24. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. What do you think that means? Hardly. Enthusiasm. Zealously. While you're driving to work, I can hardly wait to get there. I just can't wait to get up tomorrow and get at it. Do I have to go to work today? Surely they can test me and I have COVID-19. I can stay at home. <laughs> I don't feel like going to school today. Surely I can fake it and have a headache or a stomach ache or something. Did you ever try that, kids? I did. I'd try that occasionally. Unfortunately, I had a mom and dad who said, okay, we'll take your temperature. No temperature, go to school. And even if I had a slight one, you're okay. I grew up with the philosophy, you don't call in sick, you crawl in sick. Now with COVID, that might be a different thing, but hey, just because I got a little ache and pain doesn't mean I can't do the work, right? Whatever you do, do your work, Colossians 3.24. Do it heartily for the Lord rather than men knowing that the Lord will receive the reward, excuse me, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. 
back to Ephesians, but slaves as Christ. He's your ultimate master. He's the one we're working for. You know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm working for the Lord too. Really, God made us to work. Working is really very important for, uh, for human beings. And doing it well. If we're working for the Lord, it ought to be doing well. That's why I like the way we make our church look nice. We're working for the Lord. Now, I don't think God likes slop. And I don't think God likes us to do things half-heartedly. Of course he doesn't. He already said here. And I don't think he wants us to do it sloppily. He wants it to do the best that we can do. Now, you know, we all aren't perfect in everything we do, but what we do, we do the best that we can to the best of our ability. The ver there's a, this is not a verse in the, Bible, in, the, in the Bible where it says idleness is what? The devil's workshop. We need to be working. Doing the will of God from the heart. The word heart here is the word sukos, which is soul. Doing it from deep within. And if you're having trouble with this, pray to God and ask him to give you a full heart with what you and I do. Doing the will of God from the heart. Being a slave, if that's what you are, employee, then we do it. We're doing the will of God, like I said before. This is the will of God. If you're a farmer, you're a will, this is what you, God puts you to do. If you're a housewife, that's what God puts you to do. If you're a nurse, that's what you do. If you're accountant, that's what you do. Whatever you do. You know, if you're doing what, if you're living for the Lord right where you are and doing what you are, you're as important as a missionary to Timbuktu. By the way, there is a place called Timbuktu, I found out. But if you're, you know, we say the missionary has to go to the field because we want to make sure it's a will of God. And we do. We want to make sure the pastor that's here is in the will of God. But you know, you are also in the will of God. What you are, you are doing, and you're doing it from your deep within your soul. <clears throat> I had a series of messages uh, three or four years ago when Matt McGrew was still in uh, Iowa and went up there for a men's conference, and they wanted me to speak on work. So. I spoke on this passage, but I added quite a bit more. And one of the things that became apparent to me is work is not necessarily guaranteed success. The harder you work. And you who are, and we in an agriculture society here know that. You can work hard and in 20 minutes lose your whole crop. It, it, you're working hard is not always parallel to success but you are to work hard look at 1 Corinthians 10 31 I show it to you whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of God Philippians 2 14 and 15 do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent Children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Don't you think your employer knows your attitude toward him? Kind of quiet in here. Yeah, he knows how you think of the boss. He knows what he think of the job. We're to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. 
and we are living in a crooked and perverse generation, and we ought to be entirely different in high school, grade school, college, and in our work, and around our neighbors. Paul was an apostle by the will of God, and you are what you are by the will of God. And we've listed all these things. Look at verse 7. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. Again, he reiterates this. Doing your slave work, basically, that participle is present participle, is doing your present say, slave work as to the Lord and not to men. This service is rendered out of good will. Zeal and enthusiasm is to be done a master, whether he's a Christian or not. Do you like dead, boring sermons? I don't. Um, do you, do you want to listen to something that just goes on and on and dead and it appears like he doesn't even want to be there? Have you ever heard those? I mean, I sat in sermons, and the first thing I looked at was my wristwatch. And then he, I thought he was going to land the plane, and he takes off again. You want somebody that's enthused about his work, enthused about what he does. You like to hear somebody say, I love my job, not just on her T-shirt, but they really love their job. And you can tell it sometimes in waitresses or people who are in the service business. The believer is obligated to serve with all his energies. This means a Christian slave is to be the best possible Christian slave. A slave is to remember that his service is to the Lord and not to men. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, ready to refer to it. Whether then you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jew or Greek or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many may be saved. Here we see the reward. Knowing that whatsoever good things each one does, knowing that whatever good thing each one does. In other words, we're working for the Lord, and he rewards us. He rewards us. Remember the good servants that came back? One had a lot of talents, so he got a lot of rewards, but everybody got rewards with the exception of the lazy guy who buried it. There's no excuse for laziness or a lack of excellence in the church. Sometimes churches, congregations, I'm not saying this one, I think this was an excellent con congregation, and, and people buy, drive by notice, even though they don't come in here, they notice what God is doing and what is the hard attitude of the people that are attending the church, right? They can see it. I talked to a truck driver years ago who came up actually and hauled some hogs for one of our farmers. And he'd been driving back and forth. And he said, you know, something happened to your church. I see more cars there and I see uh, more building going on and I see the place looking nice and you taking care of it. <clears throat> he said, I know something's going on there. Since a slave is serving the Lord, he will receive back from the Lord. And the word knowing here is a word, is a comprehensive word. You know for sure. And a slave can know and expect proper rewards even if he has an ungracious and cruel master. He'll receive. knowing that whatever good things each one does. Since this is true, there's no need for bitterness. 
because all faithful service is the ultimate master, is to the ultimate master and Lord. And the final day of recognition and rewards is still coming. Sometimes you work for a place and you can, uh, they'll give you a opportunity to make investments or IRAs or however that works. And when you retire, you have a little account that you built up working for them. Well, let me tell you something. When you serve the Lord, you are putting in a retirement account in eternity, and man, will that pay back the difference, right? You know, I can drive a truck for the Lord, and I can be a Christian and drive the truck not for the Lord. I can climb into the cab of the truck, and I can say, God, thank you for giving me this job. I want to drive this truck for you. Or I can get in a truck and say, man, I hate this job. I wish I had a better job. I wish they'd pay more. Why do I have to do this? I, so-and-so in church across the aisle, he's got a cushy job, and i got to drive this truck. You know what? You don't get a reward for that. You don't get any reward for that. You get in that truck and say, God, thank you for this job. I'm here to serve you. I'm going to drive this where I'm supposed to drive it. I'm going to deliver what I'm supposed to deliver. And I'm going to, customers that I meet, I'm going to, they're going to see the joy of the Lord in my heart. We buy things sometimes with uh, online. So we have uh, people to deliver it. There's one guy that delivers it. Man, he's a joy to talk to. I mean, he's on, he's on a go. He doesn't spend much time, but he says, Hi, Rod. You guys having a good day? Because some of the stuff comes from the church. How's your church going? And he's not even of our faith. But it's an opportunity for me as to receive it, to receive it to the glory of God. And what a difference it makes. And you all and I all can, who doing our work can make a difference in the person with whom we work and for whom we work as a believer in Jesus Christ or for the teachers in school. You teachers can tell, can't you? May God take the words of his word and boom them into your heart. I guess I should end it this way. Maybe the reason you can't work for the Lord is because you don't know the Lord. Maybe you've never given your heart and life to Christ in salvation. And you may be an unbeliever as a teenager or as a college student or someone who's here, and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, it is a miserable world because without Christ, there is no hope. And you're not laying out for yourselves treasures in heaven. You're going right straight to hell when you die. And there's no hope there. There's nothing but judgment. But while you're here on earth, you have the opportunity to place your faith and trust in Christ, knowing that your own sins are making you miserable. Christ died for those sins, and you can repent of those sins and place your faith and trust in Christ and know and have hope and peace. If you need further counsel or want to talk to me about it, I'm available immediately after the service. I'd be more than happy, or some Christian here would be more than happy to talk to you about your eternal soul and your eternal destiny. Let us stand for prayer. <clears throat> Lord. I thank you for the hope that you can give within us and the power of the Holy Spirit to do our work, giving honor and glory to you. May you, Lord, teach us to do this. May you teach us to be pleasant. Let the Spirit of God, the love of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, exude out of us in our places of employment, in our homes, wherever we may be. 
We pray too, those who are here without Christ may come to know him, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.